there is a pandemic attacking the United States. The visible symptoms include drug abuse, infant mortality, lowering life expectancy, mental illness, obesity, damage to child well-being, high school dropouts, decreases in math and literacy rates, increases in teenage birth rates, increases in homicide rates, and many more. As with most epidemics, the families in the lowest income brackets are the most vulnerable. In the United States, we have a safety net that is supposed to help people avoid this dangerous end of the spectrum. There's a social safety net that's funded by the government, which has lots and lots of different components, lots and lots of different programs. I mean, it's everything from food stamps, to welfare, to Medicaid, to housing assistance. There's a whole host of women in WIC or women in children. There's a whole host of programs that are designed as a safety net to make sure that those who are the um, lowest income individuals uh, don't end up in dire situations, um, don't end up homeless, don't end up without food to feed their families, things like that. We, the country has moved towards um, reducing the safety nets. The state regulations for in individual practitioners is highly variable. We have experienced many circumstances recently in several states that we operate in where more than 30% of our specialists do not take Medicare or Medicaid um, patients. The status of affordable health care varies widely between the states, but the costs are much higher for low-income families living in states that turn down the expansion. The states that turn down the expansion include Florida, Iowa, Kansas, South Carolina, Nebraska, Louisiana, Wisconsin, Alabama, Mississippi, Indiana, Georgia, Oklahoma, Virginia, Texas, Missouri, and potentially Nevada. The interesting part is that the pay of the governors deciding the future of healthcare within their state ranges from $85,000 to $175,000 per year. This is well above the median pay in the United States and well above the poverty line where people are more susceptible to illness. Refusing this expansion left 3,492,273 U.S. citizens uninsured and at risk. Risk that the governors don't understand. Healthcare is not the only social program that is actively being targeted. In the recent election, Senator Romney voiced his opinion to axe PBS. This was an interesting position for various reasons. PBS spending only accounts for 0.014% of the U.S. budget, and the majority of the funding comes from private donations. Senator Romney only looked at the monetary cost of the program rather than its purpose as a criteria for cutting the funding. PBS's stated mission is to create content that educates, informs, and inspires. To do this, PBS offers programming that expands the minds of children, documentaries that open up new worlds, non-commercialized news programs that keep citizens informed on world events and cultures, and programs that expose America to the worlds of music, theater, dance, and art. Cuts to these type of programs would hurt citizens who cannot pay for cable or computers with internet access. Spending cups for this type of social education and improvement programs hurt families who cannot afford the luxury of the alternatives. Um, in most of these programs that I work with, they are mostly um, low-income Hispanic families. A lot of them bilingual. I know a few semesters back, or even just this last semester, I've had kids who only spoke Spanish because they were recent immigrants. And um, this program is sort of what the community has and what it can offer for these kids. So I think they're great things and it's too bad that it always depends on money. Because the, the motivation is there, the kids want to do it, the parents want it, the community wants it, but it's tough. In the last four years I worked in three different places, all involving education, arts education. and. Um, one of them, an after-school program at a community center in downtown San Jose, it's, all its funding comes through grants that it applies for and that it receives and through the little bit of money that the city of San Jose gives it. So what we can offer for the kids who come to that after-school program varies greatly, even just semester to semester. We don't really know if we'll have even the space. Well, there are certain aspects of the program that get cut or that can get added. Uh, I know every semester I'm always 
on that cusp of whether I'll get hired or whether I'll be fired or you know that sort of deal. The Affordable Health Care Act, PBS, and after-school cultural programs all seek to alleviate the symptoms of inequality or protect against further damage. The public support and utilization of these programs is increasing, but the funding and support from the government is decreasing. We are seeing an unprecedented amount of corruption and inaction in Congress, which has earned the 112th Congress the demeaning title, the Do-Nothing Congress. This title has only been awarded once before, and many political experts are hailing the 112th Congress as the worst Congress ever. To reward themselves for their work, Congress has been awarding themselves salary increases since the Great Depression. The net value of a congressman has rose from 280000 to 725000 when the net value of the average citizen has declined over the same period. In election season, the presidential candidates will often seek the blue-collar vote by interacting with the lowest income bracket. A candidate might spend the afternoon talking to a plumber or factory worker and pledge to increase their quality of life. The poverty level has stagnated in the U.S. and unemployment is creeping upwards in this economic recession. The president will make speeches claiming the public's best interest, but the disconnect between the president and the lower class is too powerful to overcome. The division between the central government and the public lies at the heart of the income inequality issue. Um, well, in terms of fixing things, the school board is ultimately the connection between the community to greater and higher legislation, but it is also the community who elects all the school boards. And if there's internal conflict within there, between getting to the higher legislation, things can get lost and it becomes a mess. <laughs> Well, at the end of the day, it's ultimately the community's responsibility in who they elect as officials, as the representatives in the government. And if we're not happy with their choices that they're making, the people who we elected, it's, it's on us. I mean, you know, some people would predict really extreme outcomes like revolution or, you know, huge instability. I, I don't think that that's what's going to happen. I think, I'm, I'm hopeful that you know, the average citizen will come to recognize that there's a problem and then through the, uh, you know, through our elected officials make this more of a priority for policy going forward. So. We have um, an obligation to provide that level of care and we take that obligation very seriously and as such, in some cases as I mentioned, we go out and we hire physicians to assure ourselves that populations receive, the be that all population, regardless of payer, regardless of economic status, receive the same level of care. My belief is there are enough Americans who believe in, in, a, in a social contract that includes a more secure safety net and um, hopefully it'll galvanize them to supporting politicians that will, you know, strengthen or, or fill in the gaps in the safety net. I mean, I think if that doesn't happen, you just see more suffering. I mean, more homeless people, more hungry people.